uh, I would like to thank Dr. Ramamurthy for inviting me. And uh, I would say that uh, my previous speaker, Dr. Meena Kumari, very rightly said that life began on sea. And therefore, we heard from her the kind of impacts which are going to be there in coastal and marine area. What I now want to take you is up in the mountains. Because the two ecosystems which are going to get affected are undoubtedly the mountain ecosystem and also the coastal and marine ecosystem. And I would be sharing with you the kind of efforts that we are doing. Coming to the Himalayas, as you understand, these are called as the water towers of the world. These are also called as the third pole because the largest concentration of uh, glacial ice is there. And these are very important source of water. As many as 10 rivers originate in the Himalayas, and therefore, life and livelihood of a million of people who live downstream are affected by what happens in the Himalayas. And that is where we are trying to look at that how climate change is going to affect in this area and what we can do on that. But at the same time, Himalaya is also a very interesting place in terms of ecological diversity, in terms of biological diversity, in terms of species diversity, a huge amount of endangered endemic species of all taxonomic groups are found over here. And at, at the same time, the Himalayas are also very rich in uh, human and social and cultural attributes. The river Ganga, as you understand, is revered by everybody. So a large amount of both human life and animal life and plant life is dependent on what is going to happen in the Himalayas. And it is with this background I'm going to share some of our experience. I want to show you these two pictures. The one on the left was taken in 1936 by a famous naturalist called F.D. Champion. And as recent as 2006, his grandson, uh, James, uh, came to India. He took over that. And you can see the difference in the ice composition and quantity in these areas over there. At the same time, this is the place where Ganga originates. And there are now evidences to show that the glacial ice or the melt is taking place. And this is the area where called Gomuk, where the Holy River originates. And see in the next slide what is now being shown. On your right, you can see the shrinkage of the Gangotri Glacier taking place. So this is not now anecdotal. This is hard scientific data which is there to show that all glaciers are shrinking, particularly the Gangotri Glacier, which is of great interest. You can see the amount of uh, compaction which has gone over there in different years. From uh, 1780 to 2001, different agencies are monitoring and mapping what kind of changes are going to occur over here. Now, these are called as extreme climatic events. You hear sometimes large amount of rainfall occurring in an area. So these kind of things are an indication that not all is well with our environment. You can see these four slides which you can see. In 1880, the Kedarnath Shrine looked like that. See the amount of development which has taken place in 2010. And about three years back, we had a glacial lake outburst in Uttarakhand, in Kedarnath. And thousands of people lost their life. Enormous amount of property got damaged. And it is now the government is trying to restore and rebuild it. What I'm trying to say that there are many changes or stochastic changes, as we say, are occurring in the Himalayan system, which are a very clear indicator that all is not well. It is what we call as a wake up call to let the scientists know, to let the people know, let the ecologists know, let the environmentalists know that things are not well and we need to change our lifestyle. We need to look into sustainability aspect as well. As I said, water and food security are linked. These are some of the projections which say that up to 50 million people are going to get affected if changes or climatic changes occur. These are data from three valleys, from uh, the Indus, from the Ganges, and from Brahmaputra. And the quantum of water available, both upstream and downstream, is going to change. And it will have serious impact on the agriculture productivity. Uh, Dr. Meena Kumari talked about fishery productivity. 
because fishes on which the life depends, our protein requirements are coming from fishes. Same thing is imagine a life without agriculture. It is just impossible because if food security gets disturbed, then all our lives and livelihoods will be affected by that. This is, I'm sure you, some of you would have seen this picture on the left. This is the replacement of species. See, as temperatures are changing, some species are going up, some species are going down. This is a species, the Arctic fox, is now being given a uh, change to the other common species of the golden fox. So if these kind of changes occur, then we are going to have great amount of efforts in the country or in the world, which would be very difficult to contain over there. Now, see this. Everybody knows where monkeys live. We sent a recent team to Trans Himalayas, and you can see that this is the rhesus macaque sitting up. And this is an elevation of 13,000 feet we are talking. So see, in this way, things are changing. Species which were occurring at a certain elevation, some species are going up, some species are going down. And we do not as yet know the pattern of it. And it would be very, very difficult for these species to survive the impact of climate change if it continues like that. Because species are adapted to certain elevations, to certain attitudes, to certain precipitation, certain temperatures. And this is how the climate change is going to play. And that is why it is so important for the biological sciences to spend more time and effort to look into that. And that is the reason this mission, again, my colleague, Dr. Meena Kumari mentioned very few minutes ago, the eight missions that we have. This is a very, very important mission for sustaining Himalayan ecosystem, NMC it is called. And this mission is now looking at how the biological sciences have a role to play in the context of climate change. There are other seven missions also, but this particular mission is looking after the Himalayan system. And uh, my own institute has been given that responsibility to look at the changes which might occur in the animal fauna and the animal biodiversity as a result of climate change. So these are the task forces of the Department of uh, Science and Technology. And uh, I would be talking a little more in depth about the task force on the fauna, the wildlife, and the animal populations, how these species are going to get affected, and what is being done over here. So this is the uh, project that we have, assessing and monitoring of climate change effects on wildlife species. I have no hesitation in saying that if you look at the entire discourse of climate change debate, it is the physical scientists, the geographers, the modelers, all those people are contributing, but somehow, the imprint, what the biological sciences should have, is not there. So this is where is an effort now that biological sciences, whether it are plant sciences or animal sciences, they need to come forward. Because if animals and plant species are getting affected, then obviously the entire biodiversity and human lives and livelihoods will be affected. So we have uh, basically uh, a specified objective to do focus research. I'm making a special point on that. We are all familiar with research, but here is the task that you pick up certain species, certain ecosystems, do it in a very focused manner. And first of all, identify what is driving that change. See, if you've been following the climate change debate, some people believe it, some people don't believe it. But the most important factor which has been caused, which is causing the climate change, is you and I, the human impact of it what we call as the anthropogenic impact of that. So we need to understand that what is our role, what is the role of other species, and that is why driving drivers of change is very, very important. And ultimately, managers, policy makers will like to take a decision. So where is that decision support system? So as a part of this uh, task forces that we have, a decision support system is being made, and we need to explain to the world the different scenarios. See, you, you often hear that debate that if two degree temperature rises, such and such things are going to happen. But what is that we can say in respect of animal and plant species? What is going to be the impact if the temperature goes up 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees or 2.5 degrees? And that is where we are now working to look at these scenarios which are there and to build up a database. All those of you who have handled a database know very well that many times we take effort to set up the database, 
but these databases do not talk to each other. That means you cannot readily exchange data. And if you cannot readily exchange data, your effort is not worth the kind of thing that you are doing. So here we are using the word interoperable. So all the databases, whether it is developed by geologists or plant scientists or ecologists or wildlife experts over there, should be designed in such a manner that it becomes, uh, it talks to each other, it becomes interoperable. And lastly and most importantly is the need for building capacity. Where is, are our institutions, where are our universities, where are our departments who are now geared and trained to take up research on climate change? So that is also part of the project which is there. We have developed a conceptual framework. As I said, for the last uh, two years now that we are working, uh, what the Wildlife Institute of India does is uh, to specialize in primary data collection. We are aware of the secondary data. I will be talking about secondary data also in a while. So we are trying to put both things together. Whatever is available from the secondary sources, we are trying to collect that. And whatever is to be collected new, I will be explaining to you in a while how we are going about in doing that. In this climate change uh, uh, scenario, collaborations are very important. No single institution, however good it is, can say that we know everything about climate change. So we are now collaborating, as you can see, with eight to nine institutions from the tropical meteorology in Pune to CSIR lab in Lucknow to university in Punjab and so on and so forth because we need different kind of expertise to deal with this issue. The subject is very, very complex and nobody can say, no department can say, no university can say that we know everything about that. We don't know, need any collaboration. So this is where we are now organizing ourselves. Three areas we are looking, terrestrial ecology, aquatic ecology and human ecology. So we are now collecting information on microflora and fauna. We are doing it on insects, on herpetofauna, on birds and mammals. So these are the taxonomic groups on which the effects of climate change are going to play as and when it occurs. At the same time, fishes are very, very important. And again, as I said, uh, Dr. Meena Kumari explained at length that what is going to happen to the fish culture and fish production and how sustainability issues are to be there. And lastly and most importantly are the human ecology issue. This is again a very important branch of science because in climate change debate we are saying that with populations going up, with human populations going up, lot many things that you and I are doing are going to affect the climate of this earth. So therefore these are the thematic areas we are looking at and ultimately we want to bring everything to what is called as a spatial ecology. You might have used uh, maps and GIS and other things which gives you a two-dimensional ability, but we need some very strong inputs in spatial ecology because Himalayas have to be looked in three dimensions. Because in terrain is very, very important in the Himalayas, aspect is very, very important. Therefore, our modeling effort should be able to do that. And this is where we have started. Uh, it's a big area. We have started first from the Western Himalaya where we are located in Dehradun. We need to move westward towards Himachal Pradesh and we need to move eastward towards Sikkim. So eventually in the six year time, we are going to cover all aspects of it. And right now I'll be sharing with you what we are doing. This is the famous Bhagirathi Basin, 70,000 square kilometer in area. And the important point is that from an elevation of 500 meter to 5,000 meter, you can travel or traverse and you will still be in Bhagirathi Basin. So what I'm trying to say is species are dependent on elevation. So we have fixed that, that what species are found at 500 meters, what are found at 1,000 meters, what are found at 5,000 meters, and our scientists are monitoring their movements up and down. And that is how we will be able to say first for Bhagirathi Basin and then move on to others. Uh, both, uh, all those people who have interest in climate uh, science also know that availability of data is a big issue. All the models which are being used currently by all global experts are very generic models. These are global models. Now global models are fine, but you can do something only with global models. You need to change them to regional models. You need to change them to local models. And that is where our effort is. You can see these data loggers, which we have been put in different 
system in Devdar forest, in Burj forest, in Trans Himalayan cold deserts to monitor and to get what is called as a fine scale data. Because when we will go for predictions, when we will go for these projections, then you need some very sensitive data which has been locally collected, regionally interpreted, and then we need to go from the global level. If we talk, most of the talk at this point of time is global models, which I don't say are not needed. They are fine, they are, uh, they are needed, but they do not, cannot precisely predict what is going to happen. Because most people will like to know what is going to happen to my district, what is going to happen to my state, what is going to happen to my city. So those projections can only come when you have these uh, fine scale data collection and picking up, as I said, of Bhagirathi Basin, we have now put up these 70 uh, extremely sophisticated data loggers and we are now collecting information on all aspects. As you can see on soil, on nematodes, on mammals, on herpetofauna, on avifauna, so that we can then take a combined uh, view on that. Because it is our prediction that some species are going to go up and some species are going to go down. We do not know why. And that is what you need, this fine scale data collection, which is what we are doing with the uh, real time data collection through these data loggers. Our scientists, a team of 25 scientists is working in the field in the Bhagirathi Basin trying to collect the data. And we are using all kinds of direct and indirect methods to collect, uh, to know the presence, to know the abundance, and to know how the shifts are going to occur. Already in the last one and a half years, some very interesting facts are coming up. As you can see, it's the red fox, which was never sighted in the Himalayas. The wild dog was never sighted in the Himalaya. We, our scientists have reported a frog in Bhagirathi Basin, which we suspect might be new to science. See, when I say new to science, you need to be very, very sure. So those tests and those validations are going in. And that is what I'm trying to say, that even today, the Himalayas are unexplored uh, to many species and many taxa. And that is where we are trying to find out over there. And these are many of you who know these methods of trapping the litter and nest monitoring. See, when these temperatures will change, ability of the animal to reproduce will change. And if the reproduction gets affected, obviously the species conservation will get affected. So we are now looking at all these aspects of that. Many times, those who have studied biology, morphometric characterization is so very important. So all the fishes that we see, all the animals that we see during our sampling, we are collecting them, we are using the morphometry, we are also collecting blood samples so that we can do the molecular characterization. And ultimately, in few years time that we are able to uh, come up with these reports, we can make the contribution over there. Already, two factors are very important, the change in temperature and the change in precipitation. So whatever information we are having, it is showing that there is some indication that temperatures are going up. And when I say some temperatures are going up, it is high up in the mountains. So in the higher mountains, the temperatures are rising. And if the temperatures rise in the high mountains, all the species which live over there, those species are going to be affected first. So that is where we are looking very closely on that. These are some of the initial models that we are preparing and exchanging with the scientists. And again, as I said, the real challenge is that how do you convert a global model into a regional model into a local model? Because these changes are going to occur at a local level. And when these local level changes will become large, they will then convert into regional, and when the regional changes will become large, they will be at the national level also. Now this is a very interesting fact I want to share. I myself said that uh, there is not a research in Himalayan mountain ecosystems. See the result. We put all our team together, and they looked at each and every published information from 1780 to 2016. Look at the gap. Look at the range which we had looked at. And we were able to find as many as 4,674 articles on different taxonomic groups which are there, and as many as 9,000 authors have contributed. And you can see some of the eminent authors which are there. So what I'm trying to say that Anecdotal information is also very important. Scientific record is also very important. So from these studies, these are all published studies, we are trying to find out that when, at what location, 
at what year, what point of time a particular species was present over there. It's now in 2016 that our scientists are going in the same area and they are trying to find out whether the species still occurs or it has moved up or it has moved down. But this is a very important uh, piece of research which we have been able to do in the last two years. We also looked at the pattern. See, starting from 1841, the Asiatic Society of Bengal was the only agency where people or scientists were publishing their stuff. Then came the Bombay Natural History Society, then came the Forest Research Institute, then came the Zoological Survey of India, then came the National Botanical Research Institute. And finally, in the last 20 years, uh, my own institute, the Wildlife Institute of India, has been very active over here. And you can see in the, the number of records which have gone up in last 20 years on different, uh, the maximum studies are still being done on birds, followed by mammals, followed by autonata. But we need more such studies, and I would request all those who are interested in the study of biological sciences that this is a very important gap area where we need to look into that. Uh, publications, as I said, are very important, and uh, we are whatever we are now publishing, uh, publishing in journals always takes time, but you can always do an electronic publication. We do it on our website first, so that all this information that I am talking about is now available on our website. And this is something, uh, an initiative I wanted to share with you, what is called as citizen science. See, not everybody has to be a scientist or a biologist or a professor or a PhD holder to contribute to science. Many common people, common citizen, there is a lot of people who are visiting Himalayas because of religion, because of tourism, because of different things. Now what we have done, based on our 20 years of research, we have identified some 15 species of different groups of mammals or birds and butterflies and insects and plants. And we are very closely watching them. And this is what we have done. We have produced a booklet and we have provided information and we are requesting every visitor, when you go to Padrinath, Kedarnath to pay and respect God, please do. But if you see a species over there, if you see a black neck crane over here, if you see a snow leopard over there, please send that. So that is a very, very important part of the process and we are getting some extremely useful information by student groups, by researchers, by pilgrims, by old people who are on those tracks. And these are many, many number of people than what uh, I have only a team of 20 scientists, but there are more than 15, 20 lakh visitors who are visiting it. So this is again a changing trend in science that we need to look at biological science uh, in citizen science. And in very simple manner, you can, everybody is carrying a mobile. All you need is to say that this particular species was done. Most mobiles have GPS also. So you can also record the altitude that this particular species was found at 2,567 meters. And that becomes a very important record. And same thing we are, we are doing. Now this was one part of it. We are now using very sophisticated uh, modeling tools. Because the entire climate change debate, if you go in the world, you will find that modeling and projections are going on. On your left, we are aware of a two-dimensional modeling, but on your right, you see, is a three-dimensional modeling. So we have set up a very sophisticated lab. You, these are called as visualization tools, because you know in the mountains, aspect becomes very important. It is very difficult for any scientist to climb this side and go to the other side and come back again. But using sophisticated software, it is possible. So that is where our visualization lab is working, that we have set up this lab for the Western Himalaya, right now for the Bhagirathi Basin. This is helping us to know that what happens on the other side, what is happening on the other side of the aspect of the Himalayas. And this is again going to be a very, very important tool as we move along. So this is what I wanted to share with you, uh, the kind of importance of the research and what needs to be done. Thank you very much.